Well, good morning, Mr. Everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning at Lighthouse Discipleship Center. Uh, my name is Dave Everett. Uh, our website is lighthousediscipleship.org. So we, if you've been following us, we've done a little restart. Uh, we had an issue with the sound, uh, that we, apparently. Uh, so we're not sure if it was working or not working. So to play it safe, we did a restart. Anyway, all of our messages are archived on our Facebook page. I mean, uh, excuse me, well, they are on our Facebook page if you want to continue to scroll down. Uh, on our timeline, but uh, they're also on our website, lighthousediscipleship.org, as well as they're all archived on our, uh, our YouTube page, our YouTube channel. Um, which, uh, and just look, uh, all you have to do is search for Lighthouse Discipleship Center. We should come up almost right away. Uh, we have over 700 uh, subscribers, over 300 uh, videos on there. So uh, anyway, uh, we have a YouTube channel as well. Anyway, uh, without further ado, we're going to get into the message this morning, and God is revealed. Uh, and just before I do that, I want to invite you tonight at 6 o'clock. We have a Bible study tonight at 6 o'clock on the true nature of God. And then we have a Bible study on Wednesday night, Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock on the new year of the Holy Spirit. So without further ado, uh, we're just going to go ahead and jump right into the message this morning. We're talking about God revealed, and we're going over the seven redemptive names of God. Seven names, and they're not the only way God reveals himself, but that's what we're focusing on in this series. And there are seven names in the Old Testament of how God reveals himself. Uh, seven names, some people call them titles, I call them names, uh, because they're not just titles. They're how, they're how God reveals himself. It, it, it's who he is. And they all, so all seven of these names point to Jesus. All seven of these names point to Jesus, who, who is revealed to us. God said it this way, or Jesus said it this way, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Uh, uh, it says in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 1, that Jesus is the express image of God. So if we see God, Jesus, we see the Father. And all seven of these names point to Jesus. All scripture. Jesus, uh, Jesus said it this way in John chapter 4, I believe it, that's a reference. But he says, you search the scriptures, for they testify of me. Uh, all scripture, whether it's the Old Testament pointing forward towards Christ or it's here in the New Testament pointing backwards towards Christ, it's all going to point to Christ. And Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, it says, and the Bible says that, that Jesus was slain before the foundation of the world. Uh, it all points to Jesus. In this church, in this ministry, we're always going to point to Jesus. I'm not going to point it to a man. I'm not going to point it to myself or a Lighthouse Discipleship Center. Uh, Lighthouse Discipleship Center is just a, a channel uh, by which we can proclaim the gospel of Christ. It's not about us, it's about him in us. And so, uh, uh, you know, uh, we want to promote us so we can promote Christ in us. We're not promoting us in and ourselves. Hopefully that's making myself clear in that. We're talking about God revealing himself. But and, and there's a number of ways that God reveals himself. He reveals himself to, to nature. He reveals himself by his spirit. He reveals himself in his word. There's all kinds of ways that God reveals himself. But we're, talk, we're, we're, fo we're, we're zeroing in our focus in this study on these seven redemptive names of God. And uh, I believe there's even more names than just these seven names that we're going to be going through. But we're, we're focused in this study, we're looking at these seven names of God. So anyway, uh, we've been looking at them. I'm going to list them again briefly for you. And, uh, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but uh, the first week we talked about Jehovah Jireh. <coughs> the Lord is our provider. Or the Lord will provide himself a uh, sacrifice. The second name, and we went dealt with this already, Jehovah Rapha. The Lord is our healer. He's the one who heals. The third one is Jehovah Nisi, which is the Lord is our banner, or also uh, translated, the Lord is our victory, or he's our deliverer. We dealt with that last week. Today we're going to deal with the fourth name, Jehovah Makedesh. Or Makedesh. I don't know how I'm pronouncing that right. It's the Lord who sanctifies. The Lord who sanctifies. We'll, we'll deal with that a little bit more in just a minute. Next week we'll deal with Jehovah Shalom. <coughs> the Lord is our peace. The, the sixth name is Jehovah Tanishgu. The Lord is our righteousness. That's probably one of my favorite ones. And then the last one we'll deal with is Jehovah Shema. The Lord is the Lord who is present. 
Jehovah Shema. So we'll go through these uh, uh, more clearly. I spent a little more time on this during the fir our first lesson and our second lesson. I, I spent a little more time uh, spelling those out. But we'll go over these some more as we go forward. And we're going over these in order. Uh, order as they rebuild themselves in Scripture. We went with the earliest one in the, the, book, the book of Genesis, uh, Genesis chapter 22. And we're going in, in chronological order as they are uh, sequential in, 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 the, in the scriptures. So that's, that's the order we're going through. Not that that didn't mean important, that's just how we're doing. Okay? Uh, now we're dealing with the, the, you know, all these preface with Jehovah. And the word for Jehovah in this, in, on all seven of these names, is talking about Yahweh. The, uh, the, the ever, the self-existing one. The, the one who reveals himself. And God <coughs> is revealing himself as in the seven names. There's seven names how God is revealing his people. And, and they're not just name titles, like I said. They're names. There are seven ways how God has proved himself. God is our provider. It's not just a title. He is our provider. He is our healer. He is our victory. And today we're going to talk about he is the one who sanctifies us. Okay? He's the one who sanctifies us. And we'll be looking at that a lot more detail this morning. Each of these names, like I said, they point to Jesus, but they're also part of our doctrine. They're also part of our belief system, of what we believe. We believe he provides. We believe he heals. We believe he's our victory. We believe he sanctifies us. We believe he's our righteousness. We believe he's always ever present. He's our peace, and, and, and so on. But they all point to our atonement, which we, our atonement is found in no one else but Jesus Christ. Okay, so they all point to, to what, what is provided in the atonement. Okay, we'll look at that more specifically a little bit even, <coughs> excuse me, a little bit this morning as we talk about he who sanctifies. And we'll talk about this probably even more clearly as we talk about uh, Jehovah Tenisku when we talk about he is our righteousness. Okay, we'll talk about that a little more clearly as we get to that one as well. But let me just say this off of that. You know, a lot of people come to church. Yeah, I know COVID is a little interesting right now, but a lot of people, typically people come to church, not all people, but some people come when they are in, when they are in a critical time in their lives. They'll reach out to church, they'll reach out to a pastor. Uh, and when, he, when they do, God reveals himself. He reveals himself as their provider, as their healer, as their victory, as the one who sanctifies them, and so on. Throughout Scripture, throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, when people were in a critical time, get, people came to God. People came to His prophets. People came to the apostles. People came to Jesus in His earthly ministry in critical times in their lives. And what happened? God revealed Himself. God has never turned Himself away from anybody. God has always revealed Himself, and, 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 and He's revealed Himself in the manners that we're going to be talking about we're talking about in this series and, and others. <coughs> Real quickly, before we get into our, our, our study full on, go ahead, if you have your Bibles, <coughs> turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30. <coughs> and we'll, we'll uh, look at verse 19 and 20. This is just a little uh, side point as we dive into, into our study this morning. It applies not just to the name that we're going to be talking about this morning, but it applies to, to all of this. But uh, let me just read it real quick. We're just going to read two verses. I'm not going to read the whole context because <clears throat> this is not the scope of my study this morning. But it says in Deuteronomy 20, uh, I mean, sorry, excuse me, Deuteronomy 30, beginning with verse 19. It says, I call heaven and earth to record this dead against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and that thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life and the, the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swore to, unto your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. I read that out of the King James, that's just what I was turned to. I normally speak out of the New King James, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little, little bit later. But basically, I'm just going to make this point. We can choose life or death. We can choose blessing or cursing. 
In other words, we can choose to rely and trust on God, or we can choose to blame God and turn away from Him. Again, I just want to repeat that last part again. We can either choose to trust God, and and, and, and we can choose. Let me just uh, let me just read from it. We can choose to rely on the truth and choose to trust Him, or we can choose to blame God and turn away from. And you usually find that in the world. You usually find that in the church. Either people are trusting God or they're blaming God. They're either turning to Him or they're turning away from Him. And we can choose life or blessing. The blessing is in Christ. The blessing is in the finished work of the cross. The blessing is in this atonement. And this God who sanctifies us, there's a blessing. He's the one that sanctifies us. We're going to get into this. We don't sanctify ourselves. We can't. He sanctifies us. And, he's, and we're going to look at that uh, more clearly. But we can choose. We have to make a mental ch choice to, to as the gospel is revealed, as God is revealed, as Christ is revealed, we make a choice. God doesn't force us. God doesn't force to bless us. God didn't force to hit. When Jesus ministered on the earth, he didn't force healing on anybody. And there are some cities, there are some communities, he couldn't heal anybody because they were not trusting him. They would not listen to him. You know, there, there's some people, for whatever reason, I've got on their bad side, and no matter what you say, they're not going to listen to me. I can't say anything, because they, they have shut me out. And so that we have people like that. No matter what you say, they won't listen to you. You know, and uh, there's, no matter what I say, some people won't listen to the gospel. And they can choose life, or they can choose death. They can choose blessing, or they can choose cursing. It says in Galatians 3, 13 to 14, you don't have to turn there, but God has redeemed us from the curse. And we can choose to follow Jesus and because he has been cursed for us, it says. It, it says, and I didn't turn there I didn't, for the sake of time, but God has been cursed for us. Jesus was cursed for us. He took the penalty and he crucified. He, took, he became our sin. He became our curse. He became our penalty. And he died for us so that we didn't have to die. And we can choose to follow Jesus who was cursed for us. And we can choose the blessing that we receive because he took our curse. If he took our curse, he gave us his blessing. He gave us his righteousness, which we'll be talking about later in our study. But we can choose the blessing. And with, that, with this blessing, there is, not, there is hope. There is hope in our salvation. We'll get into a little bit more of this as we go forward. But again... We talk about Jehovah Jireh. The Lord is our provider. We don't lack anything because Jesus has become our sacrifice. He is a provider. And if God has given us his own son, how much more will he not also give us all things? It says in the book of Romans chapter 8. We also talk about Jehovah Rapha. The Lord is the Lord who heals. He's prescribed an ordinance. He's prescribed his name as our healer. God is the one who heals. He heals physically. He heals emotionally. He heals psychologically. He heals us spirit, soul, and body. He's also, we talked about last week, he's Jehovah Nisi, our banner. He's our victory. He's our, the Lord, our deliverer. And we need to look to God above all else. We need, he needs to be the banner of us. His banner over us is love. If you lower that banner, the enemy will prevail. But if you raise up the name of Jesus, if you raise up God in your life, and, and you will have the victory. Because in Christ, there is victory. In Christ, we have the victory in Christ. And it's, our victory is our faith. And our, our faith is a victory that overcomes the world. We need to trust God. But if we're not, if sometimes we trust our circumstances, or we trust the government, or we trust other things more than we trust God. Our victory that overcomes the world is our faith. But what's our faith in? Is our faith in what we do? Is our faith in what other people have done or are doing? Or is our faith in God? We might have done some good things. We might have done some bad things. But even in, even we're supposed to do good. We're supposed to do good works. But we're not trusting what we're doing. We're trusting Him who's doing it in us and through us. There's a difference. Even in doing good, we're not trusting us. We're trusting him who is in us. That makes sense? There's a difference. And we're also, there might be circumstances, but our God can change the circumstances. The word of God can change your circumstance. 
I don't care how dark it is. I don't care how complicated it is. I don't care how complex it is. I don't care how impossible it is. We, have, we serve the God of the impossible. We serve the God who can split the Red Sea. We can serve the God who can raise the dead. We can serve the God who can heal the sick. We can serve the God. The Spirit of the Lord is upon us, and He can heal the brokenhearted. He can set the captives free. He's Jehovah Jireh. He's our provider. He's Jehovah Rapha. He's our healer. He's Jehovah Nisi. He is our banner of victory. And today we're going to see that He's Jehovah Mekidesh. He's the one who sanctifies us. Okay, hopefully I'm making sense so far. Now, I love this, 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 this I say uh, to help Jehovah, to, to this Q is probably one of my favorite Jehovah righteousness, because anyone who knows me knows I love to talk about righteousness. That's probably my favorite subject. Seems like every pastor, preacher has a favorite, or favorites, and that's one of my favorites, and I'll, I'm excited when we get there. I, you know, when we started this church, we're in our sixth year, when we started the church, I spoke a whole year almost on righteousness. I had different titles and different scriptures and whatnot, but I spoke a whole, almost a whole year on the, on, the, on the subject of righteousness. And almost every message I teach stems from righteousness because it says righteousness and truth are the foundation of the strong. It's the foundation. See, in, in a building, a structure, a business, a marriage, a relationship, the foundation is crucial. If the foundation is good, you can build on that foundation. If the foundation is bad, you basically need to start over. <laughs> You gotta, you gotta have a new foundation, and we'll talk about that in a couple weeks. But we're talking about Jehovah Mekidesh, and the thing I like about this one, though, this name, see, all these names is how God reveals Himself. This name is given in the midst of the law. In the midst of the law, God reveals Himself as the one who sanctifies us. I love that. Okay. So, see, a lot of us think we talk down about the law. We don't talk down about the law. The law is holy. The law is good. But it even says in the book of Hebrews chapter 9 that even the law had to be sprinkled by the blood. Even the law, what made the law holy? The blood. The law wasn't holy by itself. It's the blood, it's the blood of the Lamb that made it holy. It's only Jesus that can make anything holy. It's only the blood of Jesus that can sanctify anything and separate it and make it holy. But the law is holy. The law is good. The, but the danger about the law, you, keep, don't, you don't become holy because you keep the law. Keeping the law doesn't make you holy. Being a good moral person is not what, is not what makes you holy. It's the blood of Jesus that makes you holy. It's Jesus that makes you holy. And because you are holy, you can live holy. We... The, the holiness is a fruit. It's called the fruit of holiness. The fruit is not the source. The fruit is the, it's a byproduct of the root, which is God, which is Jesus, who makes us holy. We, you can't have fruit without the root. <laughs> now, you can, you, you know, usually within the fruit, there's seeds, and you plant those seeds, and those seeds become a new root. Uh, and those, those roots begin to grow and, 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 and uh, become mature. Until, until it becomes mature, it can't have more fruit. But the, 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 the root is the source. That makes sense? Uh, we'll, get, we'll get into this. But it's the Lord who sanctifies you. And, and we find this in the middle of the law. So go with me, if you will, to the book of Leviticus. Levit Leviticus chapter 20. And I'm not going to read the whole law. I want to. I don't want this rated R. I want this rated good. Okay. I want this to be friendly. The law is good, but the law will point what's wrong with you. Christ will point out what's right with you because of what Christ has done. Okay. The law will point what's wrong with you. In other words, the law will tell you that you need a Savior. And I'm not going to read, the, again, the whole context. But the context is talking about, the, actually, the context that we're reading in Leviticus chapter 20 is talking about penalty. It's talking about the penalty for breaking the law. If I were to read the whole context, the context is talking about the, there's a penalty for breaking the law. 
And the penalty, really, the penalty comes down to one thing, death. That's why Paul calls the law the ministry of condemnation. He calls it the ministry of death. Paul taught, and in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul calls the law the ministry of condemnation. He calls it the ministry of death. Why does he call that? Because the law will condemn you. But there's no, con there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The law has a ministry to, to, of death. It has a ministry of condemnation. Why? Because <clears throat> without it, you, didn't, you wouldn't run to Jesus. If you thought you could get away with your sin... You wouldn't, you wouldn't run. You wouldn't need a savior. You wouldn't need Jesus. But we. But there is a penalty for death, and it's called. I mean, there is a penalty for sin, and it's called death. That's why we need Jesus. That's why we need a redeemer. That's why we need a savior. In other words, and we can't. We can't save ourselves. Even if we died, we would not atone for our own sins. We need the death of the savior. And Jesus. And so the law is good in that respect. Now, just because we are redeemed, and I'm going to speak to those of us who, who teach grace, because we teach grace in this church. But some people think that when we teach grace, we're just given a license to sin. Well, people are already sinning without a license. Grace is not a license to sin. People are sinning without grace. And, if you understand, and those who say that don't understand grace, because it says in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, that grace teaches us to, <coughs> excuse me, Grace teaches us to deny ung ungodliness. Grace will teach you to, not, to deny ungodly. Grace is powerful. But grace is not a license to sin. No, we... Uh, but the only thing that's going to set you free from, great, from sin is grace. Okay? At the same point in time, we're not having a license to sin. We're having a license to be free from sin. I don't want to be under the rule of, 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 of sin. I want to be set free from sin. And what sets, free, what you, what sets you free from sin is grace. <clears throat> but the, you need the law to tell you that you are messed up. That you, you, you need the you law to, 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 to point the picture that you need a Savior. Because you can't save yourself. You need a Redeemer. And that Redeemer is Jesus. And so, and now that we are holy, we can live holy. You know, those of us who are under grace, just, we're not saved by ourselves, we're saved by Jesus. But now that we're saved by Jesus, we still don't murder, we still don't kill, we still don't commit adultery, we still don't uh, uh, steal and, and, and all these things. We still, we still obey the law. We don't obey the law to become righteous and holy. We obey the law because we are righteous. And holy. That makes sense? And, uh, and uh, we'll get into some of this in a little bit. But we find this in the, in the, in the midst of the law, and specifically in the law where it's, it's given the penalty for breaking the law, God makes this statement. In Deuteronomy, I mean, in Leviticus chapter 20, verses 7 to 8, he says, Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be ye holy. Actually, I want to, excuse me, I want to start over. Let me go to the New King James. It's not going to sound too much different than the King James, but I like speaking out of the, the New King James. It says, Consecrate or sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. And keep, you keep my statutes and perform them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Now, it, it sounds like a contradictory because it says at the beginning of verse 7, sanctify yourselves or consecrate yourselves. But then it says at the beginning of verse 8, I am the Lord who sanctifies you. And so, so, so we're, we're going to hopefully explain some of that this morning. But let me just start off by saying this. Even in the midst of the law, even in the midst of the law where God is giving the penalty for breaking the law, God says... I am the Lord who sanctifies you. God says, he know he says it, but he reveals himself as who he is. That phrase, the Lord, I am the Lord who sanctifies you, is Jehovah Makedesh in the Hebrew. That's where that comes from. Okay? In other words, I know it says in verse 7, and we'll explain that in just a moment. But it says, in other words, we, we, we can sanctify ourselves. 
We're going to get into this. But you cannot sanctify yourself. Only God can sanctify you. Only God can make you holy. You can read from Genesis to the book of Revelation, and there's only one thing that can sanctify you, and that is the blood of Jesus. And we're going to get into that. But even in the midst of the law, there is nothing you can do to make yourself holy. Only God can make yourself holy. Am I making sense so far? Okay? This word mekidesh, this word sanctify in the, in the Hebrew, there's a lot of different uh, variations of the definition, but one of the ones I like about it is, is that it's separate. It means to be separate. Be holy as I am holy. Be separate as I'm separate. We don't have to live like the world. We don't have to live like the devil. We don't have to live in sin. We can be separate. Because we are separate. We are holy. We are the children of God. We are the people of God. We are born again. We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We are holy. We are holy people. And the only thing that can make us holy is, G is the blood of the Lamb. I mean, I love the book of Hebrews, especially chapter 9, in this regard. Because the, everything was sprinkled by the blood. The people were sprinkled by the blood. The Levites, the priests were sprinkled by the blood. The law itself was sprinkled by the blood. All of it was sprinkled by the blood. Only the blood made them holy. They weren't holy because they obeyed. They were holy by the blood of God. But by, the, by, the, by the blood of the Lamb. We cannot try and be holy on our own. Every religion in the world, almost every religion in the world, is trying to be holy on their own. That's what separates every religion from Christ, true Christianity is that every religion, even Christian religion, is trying to be holy on their own and without Christ. And if you can be holy on your own, then you don't need Jesus. Do you see how antichrist that is? The word antichristo in the Greek means against or instead of Christ. And if you can be holy without Christ, then you don't need Christ. That's wrong. Any message, any teaching that says you can be holy without Jesus is wrong. And we teach against that. We, we teach holiness. We teach living godly and righteous. But what we teach different than some people is how you become holy. You can only become holy by Jesus. We teach morality. We teach holiness. We teach righteousness. But we don't teach is that you can do it on your own. You don't live holy to please God. You become saved so that you can live holy. Every, every religion in the world is trying to please their God or their deity by their performance. Instead, Christianity says that God died for you to make you holy. That's different. Than every other religion. Every other religion is we're making sacrifices to please our deity. Our Christianity, true Christianity, is our God, our deity, sacrificed himself for us. But now that he did that, we can live holy. That grace that he gave us, that grace that he provided first, teaches us to live godly lives. Teaches us there's a fruit. Of it. There's a fruit of righteousness. There's a fruit of holiness. But its source, its source is God. Its source is the blood of Jesus. Hopefully I'm making sense. Mankind can never be holy enough to meet God's standards. Mankind on its own can never make himself holy. I don't care how good you are. I don't care if you obey all the Ten Commandments. You can never obey the whole law. And yet no one can. No one can on their own. If you think you can, you're a fool. You can't keep the whole law on your own. If, you're, if you are boasting in what you are doing, then you are not boasting in Christ. That's wrong. If you're boasting in what you have done, then you are not boasting in what he has done. That's wrong. That makes sense? You know, there's a lot of... I, there's a lot, I've met a lot of non-Christians who live godly lives. As, in the sense that they live moral lives. 
I know a lot of non-Christians who live good moral lives. But living moral is not the goal of Christianity. It's one of the byproducts. We, we believe in living moral lives. We believe in living godly lives. We believe in living holy lives. But that is not the goal of Christianity. Hopefully I'm making sense. The only thing that can make you holy is God through the blood of Jesus. And even if you could keep all the commandments, are you boasting what you did without Jesus? Something's wrong with that, folks. Something is majorly wrong with that. Mankind can never be holy enough to meet God's standards because God's standards of holiness is incredible. Nothing you can do to ever come close to his holiness, to his majesty, to his perfection. Paul, Paul said it this way. Paul, Paul who said he was holier, holier than most people, and I'm just paraphrasing it. By, by, he, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees and keeping the law and different things. But Paul attributed his own holiness as dumb. I'm not trying to be graphic here, but in other words, Paul attributed his own holiness to a pile of poop. That's what done is. Even if you live the best life possible, it's still a pile of done. I'm not trying to be graphic, but Paul said it. You can't ever on your own, apart from Christ, be holy enough. If you can be holy enough without Christ, then you don't need Jesus. That's wrong. We are encouraging, we are advocating for you to live a holy life. But not apart from Christ. If Christ is not, not your cornerstone, if Christ is not your Savior, if, Christ, if you're not boasting what Christ has done, instead you're boasting what you've done, something is majorly wrong. The Bible says there's no righteous, no, not one. Romans chapter 3, I think it's verse 23. The only thing that makes you righteous, the only thing that makes you holy is Jesus. Do we want you to live holy lives? Yes. Do we want you to live godly, moral lives? Yes. But not on your own strength. Not on your own ability. I want, if you, I'm going to boast, I'm going to boast in Christ. Not me. Something's majorly wrong. If I'm putting, look at what I've done. No. Look at what Jesus did. I hope I'm making sense with that. Um, could, you know, stop, in other words, stop trying to become holy on your own and receive His holiness. Receive His sanctification. Only Jesus can make you holy. Okay, All right, we're going to give you some scriptures here. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1, real quick. Some people think I'm just giving people a license of sin. But if that's the case, you're not listening. Because I'm not against sin. I'm against a life of sin. I'm against a life of Jesus. I think you but I'm not here magnifying sin. I'm here to magnify Jesus. 1 Peter 1, 13 says, Therefore gird up the loins of your mind. Your mind has loins. Okay? Gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And I'll read that again, in case you didn't get a chance to get there yet. First, we're in 1 Peter 1, 13. And it says, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. We've talked many times about being transformed by the renewing of your mind. Gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. I'm, you know, so sobriety does not have to just do with alcohol. How many of you know when someone's going through chaos, when someone's going through a trauma, when someone is anxious about something? You know, many times as a pastor, I've gone to a hospital where someone is sick or there's been a trauma in the family. And most of those people, are, they're, they're worried, they're anxious. And I understand that. Because their loved one is in the hospital. Or maybe they are anxious themselves because they just got a bad report from the, the doctor or whatnot. But it's hard to reason with someone if in their mind and their emotions they're not sober to listen. 
that make sense? The first time I go into a hospital room when, when there's a lot of anxiety, the first thing I do, I proclaim peace over that place. Because until there's some form of peace, it's hard to minister when there's a lot of anxiety. A lot of, and I understand anxiety, naturally speaking, but I can't, it's hard to have a conversation and, and reason with someone when they can't, we're not, they're not listening. And they're not listening because they're not sober-minded. Or maybe they, someone just had a, just got some bad news. Or maybe, maybe it's maybe it's another, maybe it's a different scenario. Maybe someone just made a huge mistake. They just did something really wrong. They know they did it, but now they're they're, they're just like I, I blew it. I made a mistake. I I did something stupid. I did something foolish. I made a mess of my life. I made a mess of the situation. Now I'm facing a divorce or my family or whatever the case may be. Uh, or maybe they're going to jail, or whatever the case may be, and but but they're also so anxious that it's hard to minister to them until unless they're sober-minded. That makes sense. I could talk for a long time about that, but so therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This hope, this great, we're we're, we're the rest. Our, all of our hope on this grace that is revealed to us at, by the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust as, as in ignorance. We're not to conform to lust in the world. And we're not to conform our lives to sin. We're supposed to rest all of our hope in the grace that is revealed to us in Jesus Christ. That make, and hopefully that's making sense. It's brought to by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Yes, and let me just say it this way. Let me just read from my notes for a moment. We are to rest fully upon the grace that is brought to us by the revelation of Jesus Christ. But at the same time, looking at verse 14, we are not to conform to our former lusts. We are to rest all of our hope on Jesus. But at the same point in time, we are to be holy how do we be holy? We see Jesus. At the same point in time, now that we are holy, we're not supposed to conform to this world. We're not con conform to our own lusts. And there are different kinds of lusts. Sometimes, a lot of times we associate the word lust with the word, uh, with sexual things. But gossip, some people just lust to gossip. <laughs> some people just lust to do different things. Lust, you know, the Bible says, and the Bible says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, I think it is, walk in the Spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. How do you control lust? You walk in the Spirit. You walk in the Word of God. You walk in the Spirit. You don't control the flesh by the flesh. You control the flesh by walking in the Spirit. Is that making sense? We're putting our trust, we're putting our focus, we're putting our rest in God, not us. You try. You can't control sin by the flesh. That's impossible. That's impossible. The only way you can control lust, the only way you can control the, the, your, your, your uh, I mean, you know, we're stubborn people. It was our lust, lust is a powerful thing. I'm not just talking about sexual drive, but there's other things that we lust for. That are just natural. But we walk in the spirit and we won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. It says in Galatians 5, 16. We can rest fully in God. But even though we're resting fully in God, we still, can, we still need to cooperate and not conform to the lust. We can choose life or death. There's always a choice. And we can cho choose to trust God or we can choose to trust our flesh. We can trust our trust God, or we can allow we can allow God be Lord of our life. We're talking about Jehovah, Lord. He yes, He's our Lord who heals us. He's the Lord who provides for us. He's the Lord who sanctifies us. But either He's our Lord or our flesh is. Is my my own lust going to dictate what I'm going to do or not do, or I'm going to let Him be the one who sanctifies me? Does that make sense? And sometimes it's not so much what we do, sometimes what we're thinking. I want him to be Lord over my, over my thoughts. Not, but Jesus said it, even if you, if you lust over a woman in your heart, you've already committed adultery. 
when Jesus on the on the on the on the um, and when he was given the beatitudes and different things, he 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 got to the heart of the matter. Even if you hate someone, you've already murdered them in your heart. But how do we control our hearts? The Bible says, "Guard your heart, for out of it flows the issues of life." How do we control it? By walking in the Spirit, by walking with God, by 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 <coughs> by cleaving to Him. That's why we need to be in the Word of God and have relationship with the body of Christ. All the time. Because this thing called flesh, this it, 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 there's lust to it. And we, if we are not feeding our spirit, you know, the body of Christ, when we have good Christian friends and pastors, they will help keep us accountable. They will help us keep us focused on God and not our flesh. You know, when we're isolated, and I understand we need time on our own, we need time to, to retrieve and all that, but we can have too much of that. We need, there's a balance where we also can't be around the body of Christ all the time where we need to walk one-on-one -on -one with God. But we, all, we need downtown, we need time of relaxation. I'm not against that. But if, if we can have too much of that, where we're so isolated that the enemy will prey on us. Where does he prey on us in our minds? That's where it starts. The battle's in the mind. Okay? Um, let's move forward. But we want to, I want to explain I don't want to just receive grace. I want to experience grace. Grace is, is not a license of sin. Grace is not weak. It's the grace of God that saved you. It's the grace of God. It's the grace of God that died on the cross for you. Grace is not weak. Grace is strong. His grace, his, his grace that saved us. And we need to fully rest on trust in that grace. It goes on to say in verse 15 and 16, But as he call, who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. Peter's writing this. This is New Testament. We are holy because he is holy. You're not holy with, um, in yourself. You're holy because he is holy. And where is he? He's in you. I am crucified, Paul said it this way, I am crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me by the faith of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We can't do it on our own. It must be done through him. We participate. We can choose life or death. We can choose to allow him to live in us and through us. We still have a choice. We still have the ability to have a free will to make choices. But it's still, even though we have a free will to make choices, we live because he lives in us. If you try to live holy without Christ, one, you can't do it. Two, if you could do it, you're boasting in you. You've just made yourself a God. Which is the first commandment. Don't have any other gods before me. You're trusting you. You have your faith in you. You're boasting in you. That's wrong. That's dangerous. If there's any good in me, it's because of God, Christ in me. Are we, are we encouraging you to live in sin? No. But we are, are we encouraging you to trust Jesus for everything? Absolutely. Trust that grace. Our holiness, our sanctification is part of the atonement. Go with me real quick to Isaiah. Switch, switch gears a little bit. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 6 real quick. I want to talk about the holiness of God for a moment. Sometimes we measure our holiness by the Ten Commandments. But that's not that's only a portion of the holiness of God. Isaiah chapter 6. Let me just read a little bit of the context and then I'll make some, say some things. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne. High and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 2. <coughs> above it, above the throne of God, stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two, he covered his face, and with two, he covered his feet, and with two, he flew. And no one cried, and I'm sorry, verse 3. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy. Is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is filled 
is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. And so I, Isaiah speaking, I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And then one of the seven flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken from the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it, and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And then I said, Here I am, send me. So here we have a scene here in Isaiah, where Isaiah sees the Lord high and lifted up in the throne room. And, you know, and these angels, these seraphim, were flying around him crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And I'm paraphrasing some of that. but uh, <clears throat> You know, and in verse 5 we see Isaiah's reaction. He says, Woe unto me, for I am a man of unclean lips. Or, woe is me, I am undone. You know, that would be a natural reaction to any of us who we saw. If we saw God in all of his holiness and all of his glory, as I, Isaiah just saw, we would also fall down too. And we would say, woe is me. God is so holy. So even in, you might have done good deeds, you might have obeyed the commandments, but you're not that holy. You're not as holy as God. No matter how holy you think you are, apart from his holiness, you can't, you don't even come close. If you think you can encounter God's holiness without Christ on your own, you got something else coming. The only reason you can stand before God is because of Jesus. Without Jesus, without the blood of Jesus, you could not stand before a holy God. You should, without Jesus, you would say, woe is me, I'm afraid. But here in the New Testament, in Christ, we know that we can come boldly to his son of grace in our time of need. This is Old Testament that I just read in Isaiah. But in the New Testament, it says in the book of Hebrews that we can come boldly to his son of grace. Why? Because of Jesus. Jesus changed everything. We can come boldly to his great grace with confidence. But even here in Isaiah, in verse 6, his, he, the chairman, he, his, his iniquity had to be purged. Your iniquity has to be purged. And there's only way for your, one way for your iniquity to be purged, and that's Jesus. Here it was symbolic of a call uh, from, from the altar. Isaiah was purged. He had to be made holy. The, even though you live holy, you have to be made holy. And there's only one thing that can make you holy. That is Jesus. But let me do this, this little side note. This is not the scope of my teaching this morning. But verse 8, verse eight, he says, And I heard the voice of the Lord say, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am. Send me. Because we have been sanctified and we're going to get here. God can use us. God can't use you if you're not sanctified by Jesus. We'll, we'll get into some of that. Go with me real quick to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. We'll begin with verse 1. And I want you to show, we saw what Isaiah saw. Now we're going to see what John saw. Again, we're talking about the holiness of God. And after these things, I looked, and behold, Revelation chapter 4, after these things, I looked up, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardine stone in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne. It was not about it was not about homosexuality. Okay, it was a rainbow 
around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And behold, the throne was there, a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures, four eyes in front and back. And the first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature was like a calf, the third living creature was, had a face of a, like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they did do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord Almighty, who was and who is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fell down before him who sits on the throne and worshiped him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the Lord, the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by you, your will they exist and were created. No, I, I want to repeat this again. No one on earth has this kind of holiness. I want to say that again. We see what Isaiah saw. We see what John says. No one on earth has this kind of holiness. If you think you can have this kind of holiness because you do good works, you're a fool. You're deceived. I mean, I love this scene. These... These, these four living creatures do not stop. They're constantly singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is to come. And every time they sing that, the 24 elders fall down and cast their crowns. This is a continuous thing. They've been doing it since Isaiah. They've been doing it since John. And they're still doing it today. And they will do it for all eternity. They don't stop. One, first of all, the holiness of God is not boring. It's constant. And it's a constant picture of the holiness of God. And there's not one of us without Christ who's this holy. And there's not one of us even, there's not one of us who can, is this holy. We think we keep the, we're, we're good people and we're holy enough. It's only the blood of Jesus that makes us holy. And none of us comes compare, come even close to the incredible majesty of the holiness of our God. We could never come close to this. In order to redeem us, our Lord has a power, yet our, our Lord, our King, our God, died for us so that we could become holy as He is. And our Lord has the power to forgive our sins. Jesus had to make us holy. The only God who is holy can make us holy. And the only way he can make you holy is through the blood of Jesus. And that is his redemptive name that we're talking about this morning. Jehovah Mekidosh, the Lord who sanctifies you. Go with me real quick to Mark chapter 2. I'm going to switch gears, going to switch gears a little bit again. Mark chapter 2. We'll pick it up again in verse 1. Mark 2, 1. And again he entered, talking about Jesus, Capernaum. And that's after some days and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door, and he preached the word to them. And they came to him, bringing a paralytic, who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they left down the bed with which the paralytic was lying. This is not the scope of my message. How many know we all need friends? We all need people who can help us. And uh, I could talk all, all night, all, all morning about that. But verse 5, 
When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning, and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they, had, that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, Why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier? Which is easier? To say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, rise and take up your bed and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. I love this. I mean, there's I can talk about the four friends, how we all need friends. You know, even the early church was steadfast in the apostles' doctrine, the fellowship, the prayer, and the breaking of bread. Four things in every believer's heart, lives that we need. But verse 5, he says, When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And then even the Pharisees, Acclaimed in their own hearts. Who can forgive sins but God? The religious leaders, the, the law keepers, knew that the only one, <coughs> the law keepers who were focused on the Old Testament, knew that only God can forgive sins. We talked, we talked briefly, we read in Isaiah and Revelation, book of Revelation from John how holy God is. And this holy God is the only one who can forgive your sins. Can we all agree with that? Only God can forgive your sins. You know, if we were, if God was just, and, and he is just, but we all deserve hell. None of us deserve heaven. None of us deserve his goodness. If there's any good thing in our life, it's because of his grace and his mercy. This holy God that we just read about in Isaiah and Revelation we don't deserve his presence. We don't, I mean, we don't deserve heaven, let alone his presence. One thing that, that's going to be so beautiful about heaven, there will be no sin there. There will be no devil there. It, it says in Revelation 22 that, 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 that there will be no death. There will be no sin. Sin is purged. Sin is gone. Sin has been thrown to the lake of fire. God, and the, 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 one of the worst things about hell is not so much the fire and the torment. There's no God there. Even on this earth, even with all the sin and the corruptness and the evil that's in our world, God is still on this earth. But the earth is still His glory. We, none of us, even the worst sinner that we know about, has not experienced a life fully without God. Even though they've rejected God, even though they don't have God in their lives, God is still in this world. But hell will be a place where God does not even exist. And none of us have ever experienced that. Nobody has. And one of the things nice about heaven is that there will be no sin. There will be no death. There will be no corruption. There won't be any of that. And the, the greatest thing about heaven is that God's there. And we will spend all eternity with our husband, with our, with our, with our the lover, with our God. That will be the greatest thing. Yes, there will be mansions and different things. We can focus on that. But that's not the focus, folks. The focus is God is there. The focus is always God. And, and this holy, awesome God, the only reason we get to go to heaven, the only reason we get to be with him is because of his mercy and grace. We all deserve hell. There's none righteous. It's because of his mercy we are saved. We cannot boast. Even if you kept all all the Ten Commandments and all the law, you are still a sinner. And even if you did live holy, and none of us have, there's none righteous, no, no one, we are still born from Adam. And our seed, our nature, is corrupt. We need a Savior. But if we have Jesus, we are born again, not a corruptible seed, but an incorruptible seed. I love that word, incorruptible. Some people don't understand that. But there's no corruption. There's no sin. There's no guile. It's perfect. We're born of God. It says in 1 John 3, 2, we will be like him when we see him as he is. 
right? We're born of God. We're born of his nature. There's no corruption. But we can't boast in what we've done. We still love holy. We still love godly. Not to get holiness. Not to get saved. But because we are saved. Because we are holy. We don't get there by what we do. We get there because of what he did. But now that we're saved, we live holy. The source is not us. The source is him. We, you know, the, the, the clay can't tell the potter, look at me. No, it's the potter that made something beautiful out of that clay. It's the potter who made the clay. Get alone made a nice vessel or vase or, or, or pottery out of it. The, 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 the clay can't boast in yourself. Look at me. I made myself a vase. No, you didn't. It was just a lump of clay. But God made something beautiful. It's so awesome. Um, only God can forgive sins. But it goes on to say in verse 9 and 10, I'm running out of time. Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to rise and walk, and rise and walk. And Jesus said, but though you know the man, son of man may have power and right to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, take up your bed, and go home. Now, we already talked about Jehovah Raphael, our healer, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but one of our, the proof of our sal salvation is healing. It's a byproduct. One of the, the greatest miracles here is not his healing of his paralysis. The, the greatest miracle is his forgiveness of sins. That's the greatest miracle of all. But one of the byproducts is he got to go home too. He got to walk too. He, you find this, and we already talked about Jehovah Rapha, but, but healing and salvation go hand to hand. Healing and forgiveness go hand to hand. Psalm 103, verses 1 to 5 Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget all of his benefits, who forgives all of your iniquities and heals all of your diseases. You cannot separate healing from forgiveness of sins. You can't separate them. Which is easier? They're both just as easy. And they go hand in hand. But it says in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, you don't have to turn your head because I'm running out of time. But it says, by grace you are saved through faith. Grace came first. Yes, our reaction. There's a response. There's a response of faith. There's a response of walking in holiness. There's a response. But grace came first. Love came first. You can't put faith in his grace if his grace didn't exist. You can't trust something if it's not there. But we put faith in his grace. We're not saved, we're not saved just by faith and we're not just saved by grace. His grace is available to everybody. But it's only those who trust it that his grace is powerful to save them. That makes sense? We have to trust it. We have to receive it. His, but his grace was there first. The faith wasn't there first. It says in Galatians 3 8 that faith works by love. Whose love? His love for us. We love because he first loved us. We respond to faith. We walk, we're walking out in good works. Our good works is a response, it's not the source. It's not that we were good first and then we got saved. No, he was gracious. He saved us. We became, we started doing good works, but it's not our good works that saved us. It's his grace that saved us. We should, we should walk in good works. Some people think I'm saying we shouldn't live holy. No, I'm saying live holy. But I'm just saying you're not the source. You can't save yourself. We should walk in good works. But good works don't save us. Jesus does. We don't boast in our works. We boast in Christ. The fruit of self sanctification comes from an intimate relationship with God. If you're, just try, if you're just trying to do good works on your own without a relationship with God, you will fail miserably. That's religion. That's Ishmael, not Isaac. I don't have time to explain all that right now. That's you, you producing God's promise on your own, like Ishmael, versus of Isaac, the son of promise. See, God showed us love first. You didn't make the first move. God made the first move through the cross. 
You didn't even want anything to do with God. And he saved you. You were a sinner. God moved first. And yet you want to take all the credit? That's wrong. God sanctifies you. We respond by faith. Faith works by love. We respond to his love. It, it, a lot of times when people have a faith problem, I, find, I really discover they have a love problem. Until you know how much God loves you, your faith will not work. But a communication of faith becomes effectual as you acknowledge every good thing that's in you in Christ Jesus. We are not trying to please God so he loves us. No, he loved us first. Out of a relationship. He loved us first. I don't have time to go to 1 John 4, 17 and 19. We love because he first loved us. See, love is not manipulating with good works so the other one will do good things for you. Love is not manipulation. Love is trusting each other. We are not manipulating God by doing good works so he does good things for us. That's manipulation. That's not love. We just need to trust him, trust his love in relationship, and our response will be to do good works. Our response, our good works, is the byproduct of him loving us. If we're trying to manipulate God to do good stuff in our life because of what we did, we're trying to manipulate him. That's wrong. That's not love. That would not work in a marriage. That won't work in any relationship. That won't work in an employer-employee relationship. I know to a certain level we do that. We, we're not going to get paid if we don't do a good job. But and I'm not gonna go, I don't have time to go into all, all that. But I'm trying to magnify Jesus... We're talking about Jehovah Makedesh. The Lord is the one who sanctifies you. He is our sanctification. He is our glory. We can't receive it on our own, but only through Jesus. I'm running out of time, but go with me real quick to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 26. First Corinthians 1, 26. For you see your calling, brethren, that you may not, not, I'm sorry, let me read it again. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty and the base things of the world, and the things which are despised. God has chosen the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. With Jesus, let me just say this, with Jesus there's no outsiders. No one is outside of God's circle of love. God has chosen to use the debased things, the despised things, the foolish things. If you think you're debased or despised, God wants to use you. He's going to sanctify you. And he wants to use you. God had to sanctify Isaiah and then he could use him. We are sons and daughters of God. We are the brethren of Jesus. That means we're his sibling. God doesn't have any grandchildren. He only has children. He doesn't have outsiders. He has chosen to use the debased things. He's chosen to use the despised things and so on. God has chosen you. Because he loves to choose people. If you think you're debased and, and, and whatnot... He loves choosing people just like you. Many people have found themselves ostracized from churches, from families, from different things. But God wants to invite you into his family to sanctify you so he can use you. 
Okay, it goes on to say, and say and I'm not going to have time to read this between verses 29 to 31, but I love verse 30. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. We can glory and we can boast in him. He is our righteousness. He is our sanctification. We can glory in Jesus, our Redeemer. Turn with me real quick. I, I wish I had more time to spend here. But go with me real quick to Hebrews chapter 10. Because I'm going to tie this into what we just read. Okay? Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 10. Hebrews 10, 10. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. It's important that you see that. Verse 10, I want to reverse it again. By that will we have been sanctified. Have been. It's what? Past tense. Through the offering of the body of Jesus once for all. We have been sanctified once and for all through the body of Jesus. But skip down to verse 14. For by one offering. Whose offering? Jesus. He hath perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Verse 10 said that we have been sanctified, but in verse 14 says we are being sanctified. One's past tense, our present tense, and then the, this one's future tense. What, how, we're going to talk about that in just one second, but let me finish reading. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us for after he has said, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts and their minds. There's a bit of renewing of the mind. I will write them. Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now whether there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. There's a lot being here. I'm trying to go quick, but I'm also trying not to go too fast. Let me just make this statement. Jesus doesn't have to die over and over again. He died once, and he died once and for all. Okay? We are perfected forever by the blood of Jesus. There is no, you know, as the Catholics, many Catholics believe, there's no penance. I, I think I'm using that word right, right? There's no penance. Some people think that you have to work. Uh, you have to perform penance. Then, then, and that, but he also says here at the end of verse uh, 18 that there's no longer an offering for sin. Why there's no longer an offering for sin? Jesus already died once and for all. Okay? Jesus ultimate Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice for us. But I need you to listen real, real good here. There's two things being said here. Verse 10 it says that we are, are sanctified. And then verse 14 seems to say that we are being sanctified. There's two different tenses there. Are you following me so far? And that can be very confusing. Let me just say this. We are eternally saved by grace. But it is also a continual action. We are saved and we are continually being saved. If, yes, it was, Jesus was died once and for all, but he is also... It, we, 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 we used a verse last week from Isaiah chapter 12, verse 3. With joy we can draw from the wells of salvation. This salvation is like a well. It's there. And it's eternal. But we can continue to draw from it. We are sanctified. We have the well. But with joy we can continue to draw from that well. We are being sanctified. Um, it, it, it is, it, it's not this way. It's not that we're saved and then we just stop. No, it, God has saved us. And he, he has sanctified us. And he is continuing to sanctify us as we go forward. But he's done it once for all. He's not dying over and over again. But there is a continual sanctification. We are sanctified by his word. As we continue to read his word and whatnot. We are saved forever. But that relationship is eternal. What is eternal life? Eternal life, John 17, 3, is having a relationship with God. Through Christ, we have a relationship with God. And because of Christ, we can continue that relationship with God. 
We have a relationship with God that has sanctified us. And as we continue to have a relationship with God, we are continuing being sanctified. I hope you've seen this. We need to continue to draw from the wells of, of salvation. Yes, we're saved, we're saved, we're saved. It's, it's eternal. But we don't, we don't just get saved and stop going to church. We don't just get saved and stop reading our Bible. We are continually being sanctified. Our mind, you know, if you stop going to church, reading your Bible, fellowship with the church, and, and hearing, your mind is, is, is not going to be renewed. It's not going to be sanctified. You're going to be filled with all the other junk we're listening to all the time. We, we, it, it's a relationship. You know, even though Sherry and I exchanged vows 20 years ago, we still need, need to renew that relationship daily. There's times where one of us might be in a bad mood or we're going through something, and, uh, and, 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 and while we're sometimes it happens a lot when one of us is tired, you know, and then we start getting cranky. And sometimes when we get cranky, we start saying things or doing things. You know, and then, but we have to, we have to, we have to, we have to sanctify that relationship daily and regularly. If we don't, the enemy can just have a foothold in our relationship and it can go south. But, 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 you know, we, we need to sanctify that all the time. Sanctification is a once and for all thing. But we are also being sanctified. We are sanctified, but we are also being sanctified. We are changed from glory to glory, from faith to faith, from grace to grace. You, I'm hoping you're starting to see this. It, 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 yes, it's a one-time thing, once and for all. But we are also changed from glory to glory. From faith to faith, from grace to grace. It never gets old. It gets brighter and more beautiful every day. We have it. And we are being sanctified. We have sanctification in Christ, but we are also continually relate in relationship with God, and we are being sanctified in this relationship. And since you've been saved, and as you've walked with God, God the church, is God not still giving you more revelations? If God, are you not seeing, is your relationship with God not getting sweeter and sweeter and better and better? Yes, we all have rough days and different things, but God never changed. We change. But, but, but we're being changed from glory to glory, hopefully. But I don't know about you, but my relationship with God has gotten better since I first believed. Not worse. Some people just call it the honeymoon season, and that, now it's all downhill from here. Well, our relationship has an effect like that. And, I mean, we have our days. <coughs> but sometimes we have our days with God, too. But it's not because it's his fault. It's our fault. But God sanctifies me every day. I'm being sanctified right now in the sense that as I'm preaching, teaching, not because of me, but because the Word of God is sanctifying me. It's clearing my mind. There's some things that I have in my mind, that some things we have to, we're going through. Go, go to one more passage of Scripture, and then we're going to close. Go to read Ephesians chapter 5. Oh. Actually, my, this might not be the last one. I know I'm over, but bear with me. I'm going to try to make this quick. Ephesians 5, 25. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such things. <clears throat> but that she should be holy and without blemish. I don't have a lot of time. I'm already over. I want to go to a couple more scriptures. But I want you to notice real quick. He sanctified her. He presented her to be, well, be holy and without blemish. She didn't do it. He did. But he also didn't force himself. She had to participate. She had to be willing. He did it, not her. Okay? Go with me real quick. We're running out of time. But John 17. John 17. Uh, we're going to pick it up verse 15. Jesus is praying. He's getting ready to go to the cross. He's praying with the Father. He says, so John 17, 15 to 18. He says, I do not pray that you should, I, said, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world. 
but that you should keep them from the evil one. He's praying for us. He's praying for his disciples. Verse 16, they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is true. And as you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. God is praying for us. Jesus is praying for us that God would sanctify us. He sanctified us at the cross. But he's also sanctifying us by his word so God can use us in this world. Does that make sense? If God didn't want to, God wants to sanctify you. And again, the word sanctified, yes, it means to be holy, but it means to be set apart. We should be different than the world. The Bible, Jesus said we are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth. That salt is distinct. That's, that salt is holy. It's separate. But it's a light. If all he wanted to do was sanctify us, we might as well die once we get, we get born again. But God sanctified us so he could use us. But we need it how we know we live in an evil world. And we need that continual sanctification in our minds and our hearts. Go to one last scripture. <coughs> And I will close with this one. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Thank you for being patient. I know I'm going over. First Corinthians 6, verse 9. Do, not, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And I love verse 11. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord. We're talking about the names of God. In the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. <coughs> I'm closing. Verse 11 says, such were some of you. God's grace, church, dealt with all these things that we once were. God dealt with all of this, and we have been redeemed by him. He said, we were washed by the word. We were sanctified. We were justified. We were made holy in the name of God. Jesus. We're talking about Jehovah Makedesh, the Lord who sanctifies. We don't have to live like the world. There is something different about us. It's called Jesus. It's called the name of Jesus who has sanctified us. Our God is supremely incredibly holy. All holiness comes from Him and Him alone. He is Jehovah Makedesh, the Lord who sanctifies us. It's foolish to think we can obtain holiness without him. Jesus is God manifested in the flesh, and only he can forgive our sins and sanctify us. So now that we are perfectly holy, we are perfectly sanctified both now and forever. Lord, we worship you. We magnify you. Help us to understand this. Help us to understand this by your spirit. We just thank you. You are our God. Bless us as we go, and we bless the, the people in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you for being patient. I will see you tonight at 6 o'clock as we talk about the true nature of God. God bless.